Welcome back to this series on graph theory. Today we're going to define paths and cycles. The basic idea is the following. Given some graph G, we can start at some vertex in the graph and then move along edges to visit other vertices. So for example, we might move from D to C, then from C to B, and from B to E. This procedure gives us a path through the graph. In this case, we can isolate the path as a subgraph. So we have D, C, B, and E. So we'll call this subgraph P. And now the vertices of P are D, C, B, and E, and the edges of P are DC, CB, and BE. Notice that in this case, our subgraph doesn't intersect itself, which means that every vertex in the path has either degree 1 or degree 2. This is a condition we'll want to always enforce when we talk about paths. There's another notion of traversing a graph where we are allowed to intersect ourselves and that's called a walk and we'll see walks later on. Formally, we define a path in the following way. We say that a path is a non-empty graph P which has some vertices and edges and is of the form. So our vertex set contains vertices x0, x1, and so on up to xk. And our edge set contains edges that are between these vertices. So we have the edge x0, x1, we have an edge x1, x2, and so on, all the way up to xk minus 1, xk. Furthermore, we stipulate that the xi's are all distinct. We can now see that the example above conforms to this definition. So we have a set vp of distinct vertices, and our edge set consists of the edges between these vertices. So we have DC, we have CB, and BE. We can introduce some language to refer to parts of the path. We call the first and the last vertex in the path its end vertices, and we'll call all other vertices, the interior vertices of the path. In our example, D and E would be the end vertices or ends of our path, and we'd have C and B being the interior vertices of our path. Moreover, we call the number of edges in a path its length, This means that in our case, our example path P has length 3 because we have three edges in it. And if we have a path of length K, then we denote the path by PK. I'd like to highlight a special case, and that's when the vertex set of our path only has one vertex in it. In this case, our definition requires us to put the edge x0, x1 in it, but there's no x1 in the vertex set, which means that the edge set is actually empty. So in this case, we get a path p0, which has length 0 and just consists of one vertex x0. So this is a trivial path where we start at one vertex and don't go anywhere. And it's also a legitimate path, but 
we need to keep in mind that paths don't necessarily need to contain edges. To make our life easier, we can refer to a path by its sequence of vertices. For example, we could write P as the sequence of vertices B, C, B, and E. Because there's only one way to get from one vertex to another, because we don't allow multiple edges, this uniquely uh, identifies a path in a given graph. Sometimes we'd like to refer to parts of a given path, and we can do so in the following way. So instead of writing out the entire sequence of vertices that make up the part of the path, we just write the first vertex that we're starting at and then indicate which path we follow afterwards. As an example, if I'd like to start traversing P at C and then do all of the rest of P, then I would write C P, which would then be equal to the path C B E. Thus, this notation just means that we're starting the path P at C. Similarly, I might want to start the path at its normal starting point, but end it earlier. So if we would want to traverse D, C, and then B, we would write P, B to indicate this path. So that would be the path D, C, B. We could combine both of these notations if we wanted to start the path earlier and end it earlier. For example, we could write C, P, B if we just wanted to include the path from C to B. In our drawing, that would be this edge. Finally, it'll sometimes be useful to refer to the interior of a path, which means all of the vertices and edges in a path except for its ends, and we'll do so by using a circle above the path. So in our case, the interior of P would be the path made up by its interior vertices, which in this case would also be the path CB. All of these notations might seem a little bit excessive at the moment, but I hope you'll see soon that when we want to concatenate different paths at different points, it'll become very useful to have a short notation for, for these types of objects. To practice this notation, let's consider the following example. I'm drawing a new path, P, and a second path, Q, into this graph. Now P is given by its sequence of vertices as E, F, B, C, D, and Q is given by the sequence of vertices A, B, G, and H. We'd now like to refer to the path that starts at E and goes along P until it hits B and then after follows Q. As we've learned before, we can refer to the part of the path that goes from E to B by PB and the part of the path Q that goes from B to H by BQ. Now, if we wanted to get the entire path, we would take their union, but to make the notation even shorter, we introduce a new bit of notation where we just write P EQ. And we do this when the point that we're taking the union over or concatenating the path at is the same. In this way, this notation gives us a very quick and easy way to see which paths we're traversing when we want to combine multiple paths. Next, we'll introduce some concepts concerning paths between given sets. 
For this, we make the following definition. Given two sets A and B of vertices in some graph G, we say that a path P, which is x0 up through xk, so this is indicating the path by the sequence of its vertices. Such a path is an AB path if A intersection with the vertices of P is equal to x0 and B intersection with the vertices of P is equal to xk. In other words, a path is an AB path if one of its ends is in A and no other vertex is in A and the other end is in B and no other vertex is in B. Schematically, if we have sets A and B, an AB path might would have one vertex in A and then does something in between A and B and then finally has its other end vertex in B. Furthermore, we say that two paths are independent if they don't share internal vertices. For example, if we have a second path that starts at the same vertex as this white path, but uses different vertices in between the sets A and B, and then ends at the same vertex as the white path, this would be an independent path from the white path. However, if for some reason this path were to intersect the white path at an inner vertex, then these two paths would no longer be independent. Finally, if we're given a graph H, we say that a path P is an H path if P meets H exactly at its ends. For example, if we have some, some graph H, then an H path would start at some vertex of H, then go outside of H and do something, and then eventually it would return back to H. So this concept is very similar to that of an AB path, just in this case, we only have one set instead of two. The final thing we'll do today is introduce the notion of a cycle. If we have some path P, then we can form the cycle by adjoining the edge between its two endpoints. If in this case, P is the path x0, x1, x2, x3, then C, the cycle, is given by unioning P with the edge x0, x3. Thus, in this case, we have this cycle in red. In general, we define cycles as follows. If P is some path x0 through xk minus 1 and k is larger or equal than 3, then p union xk minus 1 x0, so this is this white edge in the example above, is called a cycle. Notice that because we're just adding an additional edge to a path, we can't have repeat vertices in a cycle as well. 
we'll use a similar notation for cycles as for paths. So for one thing, we can refer to the cycle by its sequence of vertices. So in this case, we have x0, x1, x2, x3, but now x0 again, because we're going all the way around. We also define the length of a cycle as the number of edges in the cycle. And we write CK for a cycle of length K. Therefore, our above example would be a copy of C4. Lastly, we say that a cycle is induced in a graph G if it is an induced subgraph of G. For example, if we have G as follows, then we have this cycle, which I'm drawing in red. In this case, this cycle C is a subgraph of G. Now this cycle is also an induced subgraph of G because all the edges in G that have vertices in C are present in C. In contrast, if we draw a similar graph, but in this case we include this extra edge, and we look at the same cycle, call it C prime. In this case, C prime is no longer an induced cycle because C prime is not an induced subgraph of G. The subgraph that is induced by the vertices of C would include this edge, which I'm marking in green. Therefore, the concept of an induced cycle allows us to mark if there are edges in the graph G that cut the cycle in some way. Such edges that go in between vertices of a cycle are called chords. Thus, induced cycles in a graph G are exactly those cycles that don't have any chords in them. This concludes the definitions and notations we'll need for describing paths and cycles. And next time, we'll move on to prove some propositions about paths and cycles in graphs.